Right, uh, thank you, Tony, for that um, near fatalistic um, uh, examination of our future. Um, not fatalistic, but not fatalistic. I did say near fatalistic. Realistic. Um, so, further challenge to energy supply and the consistency thereof. Radical innovations in production leading to changes, balance of power between different countries and indeed between different groups within societies. A dystopia, um, the need to respond to climate change rather than sort of realistically being able to stop it. And at the very end there, Tony makes the point about how the difficulty of getting citizens, and I think this is the challenge for governments, getting citizens to understand what's happening in order that those who govern have a chance of molding and allowing them citizens to deal with or perhaps to react appropriately to these kind of changes. I see I could have given the talk in 30 seconds so Tony just did. Good, <laughs> right, excellent. It's easier for me. I was just following you. Now, if I can uh, move on to our discussants and give them sort of two or three minutes each just to open out uh, from what they've heard and with a view then to having a bit of a discussion around the table and then I'll open it up to the audience a little bit later on. Tessa, are you um, optimistic, pessimistic or fatalistic? Oh, I'm, uh, I'm always optimistic. It's, it's very important if you are a politician and I've been a member of parliament, as you know, for 20 years and I've been a minister in the UK government for 13 years, of which more than eight were in the cabinet. So all that makes me very optimistic and I've also been one of the sort of five or six people most centrally involved in conceiving uh, and delivering the Olympic Games. That makes me feel even more optimistic uh, given the conditions in which uh, huge challenges become possible. But my experience uh, of facing these huge, huge challenges and in a way um, we all come to this, I think, by analogy. And my first job in government was as public health minister. Um, and then uh, the other, uh, and w within that, one of the uh, major uh, objectives to reduce health inequality, uh, to reduce the levels of inherited deprivation through the construction of programs for early intervention in childhood and then the Olympics. Now, what's the common theme through all these disparate uh, public policy challenges, including that which is um, ostensibly the focus of our discussion uh, today? It is the need for pluralism and uh, the frustration about uh, inactivity on climate change and some of the very difficult uh, questions that Tony outlined, energy security, uh, the ideological nature of much of energy policy is what stands in the way. And uh, I think that there are long-term challenges. Known as Nigel Lawson. What? Known as Nigel Lawson. <laughs> that's a political remark. Okay, right. Well, I'm just... politician. I'm going, yeah, no, I think that's a heckle, so I'm just going <laughs> to carry on. Not of you, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that uh, the only prospect for getting a rational, long-term uh, set of policies uh, to address the acute challenges of climate change is to build the basis of cross-party agreement. I'm talking here from a UK perspective, but climate change, as many of these challenges, is heavily tiered. Uh, the impact of um, action to give effect to climate change starts with behavior change. How we all act in the privacy of our own homes. Uh, did we, how many of us turned the plugs off that we charged our phones with overnight last night, you know, and, uh, and so forth. How many of us uh, are scrupulous in meeting the recycling requirements of our local council rather than just putting everything that we can get away with into a big black bag. Um, and then there is the scope for uh, remedial action, uh, which uh, can be taken by local authorities, by regional authorities, by national governments, national governments working with the relevant industries. And then of, of course, the um, 
intractability of reaching global agreements. But what underpins this is um, a pretty brutal recognition that if you allow these policies to rest purely within the electoral cycle, nothing will happen. And that's why if I were in government now, I would be identifying three or four major areas for long-term change, which are absolutely fundamental to the resilience uh, of our society. And I would be putting an awful lot of effort into those. And uh, to move from the, uh, if you like, the, 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 the heavily strategic to the small and local to here, the reason that the Olympic, the delivery of the Olympic Games uh, on sustainability grounds, on cultural grounds, sporting grounds, regeneration grounds, confounded all expectations was the uh, stability that came with the agreed terms for consensus. And you mentioned the Olympics, and in the UK, there's no doubt there was um, all party consensus that drove that, and you were an element in that. But I was the instigator. You were the yes. instigator. Not that Sorry. we want to overstate it here, but right. I was okay. the, uh, but the battle I had in, c in, in cabinet means that I shall uh, always be quite proud of being the instigator. Very good. <laughs> but it Great. still begs the question of more generally with the fall in trust in politicians, and not only in Britain, not in the Britain by any means, that makes it difficult in the UK to come in back onto the Olympic stage. I mean, the question of how, if trust in politicians is falling away, does it make it more difficult for them to lead the kind of changes and to make the kind of policy that are needed to react to the changes that Tony was talking about? No, I think it actually makes it easier, and uh, much easier, because I think that, um, and anyway, let's set aside the question of trust in politicians. I think that politicians who think that they're ever going to be trusted are unrealistic, and trust is too high a bar um, for uh, politicians to aspire to. Um, however, so I more or less trust. I mean, more trust, more or less yeah, trust. Yeah, more or less trust. <laughs> but we, right. but if you set politics aside, we are, um, as Anora O'Neill set out so clearly in the Reef Lectures, uh, we are a society that runs on trust. Uh, we are a trusting society. And I'm being very UK-centric here, but I mean, I can talk about India um, by comparison where I was last week uh, for 10 days, if you like. Um, but uh, I think that where the public see politicians putting aside the hard edge of ideological difference in pursuit of the public interest, that increases their confidence, the word I prefer to trust, that increases their confidence in politics and politicians because they feel it's about them rather than about the politician. Okay, well, well thanks for that, uh, I'm afraid to interrupt there. Um, I'll turn to our second respondent, Craig Calhoun, indeed. Thanks, Tony. Uh, well, thanks both Tonys for the good talk and the, the passing of the floor. Um, just some quick remarks. First, regarding what, what Tessa just said and, and cited an O'Neill for, I, I have a partial pessimism on that. If we're a society that runs on trust, I think we're in trouble. And indeed, we are a society that runs on trust, and we have um, really a ma series of major problems about that. First off, at various sorts of scales. The what is the structure of trust and solidarity that works at a European scale, at a global scale, but indeed in Britain or in any other national society, there are lots of indicators of serious problems on this front and, and difficulties with sort of public trust, which, mean, which creates problems for any potential responses to an issue like climate change. And we have um, the sort of declining trust in political parties or the other sorts of indicators of difficulties in potential collective action. Um, if government is to play a central role, it must in these sorts of responses, then we have um, a real question about the political bases for being able to generate the effective responses. I think the most important thing to say about urban responses to climate change is that they're mostly hypothetical. Um, we had some yesterday, some wonderful prospective visions. Um, the possibilities are enormous, the technologies are interesting, and the realities so far are pretty small in relationship to the issue. Massive risks are real, but massive risks unsettle us more than they in themselves guide change. 
I think that, um, that they don't pr produce in and of themselves responses that go in particular directions. And so knowing that there's a risk right, explains more that people get nervous than it does what they do to actually confront this. And a lot of what does shape response is existing social organizations. So I worry that we get, for example, proposals that reflect more about uh, the existing political economy than they do the kind of response needed. And a simple example is something like cap and trade as a proposal to try to deal with carbon. Um, not entirely implausible, but a lot more about creating securitized financial instruments that can be traded in markets um, and be advantageous to Goldman Sachs than about actually confronting in the best possible way some of the climate change issues. Um, I think there are all sorts of obstacles. I won't try to detail them, but there is possibility here. I'm not unambiguously pessimistic, and this is very much a matter of cities. So one of the features of cities that's important is that cities are sites of a fair amount of social self-organization, um, a fair amount of uh, cooperation, but also tacit uh, creating of ways of, of working together and alongside each other by a variety of different people in different organizations. And so they are indicative of the extent to which it's possible to create very complex structures and systems not in centrally planned ways. And the difficulties of centrally planned response, therefore, are only part of the story. Um, but cities are also here structures of inequality in a way that needs to be recognized. It's a sort of common theme of the urban age conferences and of LFE cities. But the extent to which it's not just that there are, are the wealthy and the poor, but that cities are are structures um, shaped by the activities of production and consumption and the byproducts of them. So that cities do a lot of ext creating externalities, externalities, externalizing the impacts of production into some parts of the cities, whether through pollution or through poverty or through extreme over-concentration and so forth. So that we need to look at the extent to which these, these dynamics are constantly reproducing in new form these extreme inequalities and externalizing the negative byproducts of what we do. And I think that goes on into the, the climate change issues and who lives in low-lying areas as the sea level rises and a, s a whole series of other um, sorts of things. And we won't have the solidarity, we won't have the trust to confront this so long as we continue to reproduce these vast inequalities and, and structure them into cities in crucial ways. Um, we, we are very likely to face increasing disasters. We already do, so I actually accept Tony Giddens' suggestion that we see these kind of Hurricane Sandy Superstorm discussions as portents, um, whether there's an exact individual relationship to a trend is not. <coughs> but then we recognize that disaster is often itself urbanizing, that um, massive disasters, that, that climate change disasters don't come just in the form of walls of water hitting cities in Japan or the United States, they come in the form of ecological change in Africa. Um, that things like the situation in Darfur are intensified by water shortages and other shifts that are climatically induced shifts, and they have the impact of driving urbanization in significant parts, so that we're actually getting more urbanization in part by responses because people displaced from other forms of life end up largely becoming urban populations. And a lot of urban growth is driven by difficulties elsewhere in the larger ecology in that. And it creates an issue for resilience, not just of the cities we live in, of the big high-tech cities, but of resilience for low and middle tech um, cities in other parts of the world. And a lot of the question of lives lost and the resilience questions need to be asked there, not in the places, or not only in the places where we imagine the new utopian technologies to come. Um, urbanization has long made and remade nature, yes, and this is going on today. Um, and there are various bits of this we could go on and talk about. I would, you know, in line with my remarks yesterday, note the importance of repurposing infrastructure, the extent to which cities are rebuilding and repurposing projects, not unlike the space in which we sit, um, and that in our imaginings of ways to deal with this, imagining repurposing is often as important as imagining completely new things we would build into cities, yet our imaginations are heavily structured towards the completely new, um, as in the smart cities 
fantasies and so forth. Um, and a last thing I would put on the table is the, we come at whatever our new era is, and however we're going to describe it, we come at it at the end of an era of deinstitutionalization. Uh, unlike the post-war boom that built a variety of social institutions for dealing with problems, we come at our current situation after 30 or 40 years of undoing many of the social institutions, of weakening many of the social institutions that in fact create resilience, that help people cope with problems, that deal with social inequality. And this undermines our ability to respond effectively. Um, and this is reinforced by much of the way in which we think about the electric city. That is, our techno fantasies are often highly individualistic techno fantasies. And um, on the one hand, and yet every possible solution that's proposed is a system level solution. So we have a sort of a political individual utopian fantasy of um, the technical cities. We have a dystopian fantasy, of which is I think quite um, realistic, of systems in which people don't matter, the matrix or however you want to think about it. And we are have a very hard time connecting these into an imagining of a future which is actually amenable to various sorts of socially organized action for which we would need institutions and organizations, something between the libertarian individual and the um, massively planned system. And this places a premium on politics, mechanisms for participation, kinds of social protection that would enable people to cope. And so I think the biggest issue of responding to climate change isn't per se the technologies of response, it's the capacity to create a politics that would get us to utilize the potentials that are being offered by the technologies and other teams. Great, thank you very much. I mean, if I can play back to your question a bit like the one I asked Tessa, but about academics, intellectuals. I mean, what's their role? I mean, if I've trashed the reputation of politicians or say that somehow politicians have um, had their reputation or trust in them has fallen, actually academics, reasonably high levels of trust. I mean, where's the, what's their role in the world you've just described? High levels of trust, although a certain expectation that they'll do their own thing and just not cause much trouble. Okay. So that's not an expectation that we will deliver as much that's socially useful, that contributes to this as we might. I think academics have um, a hard time shifting their research agendas. So it's unusual. Here we look at Tony Ginz who's written on theory for years and says, Climate change is bloody important. I'm gonna stop what I'm doing. I'm gonna work on the climate change issue. This is very hard for academics in midstream of careers, and we need more of it. Um, but not just on climate change, on a variety of issues. It's also the case that we have a variety of disciplinary structures that are often antithetical to looking at major issues. Urbanization itself cuts across 10 different disciplines. The extent to which we can repurpose ourselves to look in intellectually serious ways at um, the practical issues that cut across disciplines is crucial. And finally, I'd say things like this conference are good, and what I said yesterday in the opening, that it's a social collaborative production of knowledge that's crucial that also shares it. There's no future for imagining academics are gonna think up solutions inside their universities, and somehow, by some transmission belt they get on, these are going to reach the larger public. It's going to be a collaborative process, if it happens at all, in which there are relationships with people in other settings besides pure research settings, shaping the questions that are being asked, shaping the research that's being done, creating an appetite to use the results of research, um, whether they're political actors or corporate actors or other kinds of actors. And so we'd better be building these alliances um, now, not just doing research, waiting for some chance to disseminate it later. Well, lots of people in the room will have heard that. Excellent. Uh, Enrique Penaloso. Great. Uh, here we have been, we have clarity that the cities are going to grow hugely, especially in the developing world. That means in the next 40 or 50 years, practically all cities in the developing world will grow between threefold and 12 or more fold. Uh, but not in the, the developing world. For example, the United States uh, over the next 50 years will be necessary to build the uh, homes equivalent to all of those existing in Britain and Canada together. So uh, 
the way these cities are built can have a great impact in sustainability. And what I will try to say is that sustainability or how to avoid climate change is extremely closely linked to equity. We have problems with sustainability in the developing world mainly because of inequality. Uh, for example, uh, we are building, for example, slums. We have slums all over the developing world. The poor are forced to go to the wrong places, very high up in the hills around cities, for example. So this creates a huge amount of energy expenditure for the next 500 years because this is not, they are not being located in the right places. And it's very difficult to use bicycles to reach those places too, for example. Or else, also private property of land around growing cities is forcing the development to go very far away. There is a fantastic study in Mexico recently in which they show that between 1980 and 2010, approximately Mexican cities grew twofold in population and about sevenfold in area because taking cheap land, so this inequality, the inequality is making people go live very far to totally car dependent environments, which again will consume a lot of energy. Inequality is also that which ki keeps uh, upper income people from riding bicycles, but if they feel they are too important uh, to go in a bicycle or to use public transport. I mean, the upper income people in developing world feel very fancy using the subway in London or in Paris, but they would never be caught riding public transport next to the uh, low income uh, citizens. So I would say that inequality creates bad cities. Uh, and also bad cities create inequality. But on the other hand, happily, uh, also uh, equality creates good cities and good cities create equality. And many things can be done uh, if we realize. I think we have sometimes inequality before our noses and we do not recognize it. As we had, for example, uh, slavery or uh, when we think about the French Revolution, we think so obvious what changed them, but it was not so obvious because a thousand years had gone by and everybody thought those things were normal. Or only maybe 60 or 70 years ago, there was no vote for women uh, in, uh, in our societies and people thought this was totally normal. Now, today, it, it seems to me that, for example, to have a road with traffic jams without exclusive lanes for buses is a symbol of inequality, almost lack of democracy, and technical irrationality, because it doesn't take, uh, from the technical point of view, it doesn't take a PhD from MIT or from LSE to realize that the, the most obvious way to use scarce road space is with exclusive lanes for buses. And from the equality perspective, if it's true, as all constitutions say, that all citizens are equal before the law, then, of course, a bus with 80 people has a right to 80 times more road space than, uh, than a car with one. So uh, these are very simple technologies which could solve uh, mobility. I mean, the mobility is a political issue and an equity issue, not a technical issue. And of course, this could have a, we, you could almost solve mobility in a developing country city in a matter of months if you took the right political decisions to use road space in a democratic, rationally, rational way. Uh, I would also say that uh, so that even basic infrastructure such as sidewalks will get people to walk more but in developing world there is no sidewalks. Protected bicycle way. A protected bicycle way again is a symbol that shows that a citizen on a $30 bicycle is equally important to one on a $30,000 car. So it's uh, equally important because it protects the citizen as it is because it increases the social status of the cyclist. A bus in an exclusive bus lane, zooming by as expensive cars are in a jam, is a very beautiful symbol of democracy as, as well. Uh, so I would say that uh, I mean, subways can be fine if they're done by the r for the right reasons, but see, they're simply too expensive. But often in the developing world, they are done s uh, because the upper income people want them, not because they have the slightest intention of ever getting into one, but because they want other people to go underground so they have more space in, this in the streets. So, and with subways, it's wonderful and it's beautiful, but it's impossible to solve these, these mobility issues. Now, since we are doing totally new cities, totally new cities, I would just propose that we can design 
totally different city which, with ingredients which do not exist in London or New York, which would completely and radically change the way cities are lived and used, and it would be very cheap. For example, we could have hundreds, in Bogota we did, for example, about 70 kilometers of pedestrian and bicycle-only roads, lots of such as bicycle highways, going through a very dense city. Imagine a, a new city having hundreds or thousands of kilometers of bicycle-only highways, which would be very easy to do in the new cities we built. Also, bus-only roads, the new cities could have whole networks of hundreds of kilometers, thousands of kilometers of bus-only roads, which would work like fantastic mass transit systems and would be very easy and very cheaply done. And I would say that technology, in many ways, of course, I, I am uh, optimist that it's making improvement. But for example, just to end with one last comment about this, for uh, beyond all the wonderful things that cell phones are doing for developing country people, it's amazing how the it improves their productivity. I will mention two things. One is electric bicycles, to which we re a reference yesterday. Electric bicycles can be a revolution, but you have to have the infrastructure for this because they can, you can use them uh, even in hilly cities or where people maybe are not in good shape or whatever. And finally, the iPods. You know, I think a, a, an iPod has, iPod have made bicycle riding a totally new experience. It's almost like flying low through a city. So I think, uh, but all of this has to do if we are, we have, we make the decision to make a more democratic city a little bit more for people and a little bit less for, for cars. Okay, thanks. If I can. <laughs> I can put a similar question to you to the one for Tessa, which is what you described as a way of, I mean, if, if it's not a new city, we're going to have to change a city. So, in a sense, it requires the politician to take interests on in a pretty aggressive way. Um, now, from your own experience, you've done that, but other politicians don't find it or do, don't find it nearly as easy to do what you said as, in a sense, the applause suggested people want, people in the room want. Why don't they sort of see the obviousness of your case and then just make people Look, change? Uh, it's really, as I mentioned, some things are so obvious, but we are so used to the other thing. If I had said 90 years ago that women should vote, people would have laughed as a little funny thing. Like today, if I say that any road with traffic jams should have exclusive lanes for buses, people smile a little mockingly that this is something a little funny or almost ridiculous. Uh, or when I say, for example, that clearly the, the private property of, I believe in the markets and private property, and of course, I mean, this is the, but sometimes it doesn't work. In the case of land around growing cities, uh, it doesn't work. The beauty of the market and private property is that when prices go up, uh, such as in the case of tomatoes or computers, then supply increases and then prices go down. And prices tend to approach cost, that's the beauty. But in the case of land around growing cities, so, uh, you can increase prices all you want and the supply of land that is accessible to transport, to education, to jobs, to uh, water. So I think if, if this was more clear, maybe there would be a, a battle to give. But unfortunately, uh, the poor people in developing country cities uh, are too, too worried about surviving in no, than to be able to fight. And they, even the upper income people are so powerful. I was almost impeached when I was a mayor because I just took the cars off the sidewalks uh, and I put bollards, you know, and then this was, uh, I was public enemy number one. At some point I had 15% of positive image. I even had to send my daughter to live in Canada with a brother because she was my 12 year old daughter because we were, it was almost like being a criminal because I was so. Uh, I hope that this process, which was top down led, led from the top down is not the right way to do it. I, I, I think with these new technologies, such as uh, Twitter and uh, Facebook and internet and all of these things, uh, it's more possible that this change process will be more supported 
from uh, and even more led from the interested people. Okay. Right. Thank you. And uh, again, last but not least, Mar uh, Martin Heyer, your contribution, your response. Uh, yeah. Well, I think actually it, it, it was a great uh, keynote that uh, Tony just gave us there because. I mean, um, it's nice that we have all new sort of gadgets, but we want to put them to a certain use. And you gave it a certain urgency and orientation that I think uh, is, is important. Um, as we know at the moment, we can still actually reach that two degree target, but that's technically is possible. Whether it's socially possible, that's, that's the issue I suppose here. It's not about technology, it's about how to make that society transform itself to use that technology, as was just said. And, and then you, s you realize that often when we talk solutions, we talk really nice little solutions, but not the ones that will make the change. So I'll give you a sense of the degree to which the order of magnitude issue is not in the room a lot of the time. Eh? I mean, if you save yourself a return trip to New York, you can drive your car for 35 kilometers every day. But, but this society is one in which we localize, compromise, and become more compact in the cities, but we combine it with a global life. Okay? So that is precisely the sort of non-solution that's not going to, to help us out of this issue. There is not enough biofuel to run these aeroplanes uh, in, a, in a sustainable way. So, so there is a real politics of, uh, of energy, and I think that was, was well put. And you can also actually see in a conference like this sort of the outskirts of what that politics is about. And it is as, as, yet, as of yet uncertain. What we know is that we have to think very boldly and think perhaps about 20 20th century, 21st century. Because the 20th century, say take the post-war period, was all based on fossils. It was based on global integrated organizations like the United Nations. It was based on the idea that hierarchy would solve the major public issues. And it was about based on a central rule approach. Once the elite agreed, we would just devolve uh, and the solutions would be implemented. But now we can no longer use, we can no longer use fossil fuels. And it is in the, in the mix that we now have. We have, we have five, sometimes 10% renewable. The rest is fossil. I mean, that's, that, re that implies that you have to work on a, on a, a sort of a war-based system to get into that two-degree world. We cannot rely on the UN. These sort of global institutes are not going to deliver. There is not going to be a consensus-based 193 country-wide coalition for this. So it are going to be coalitions of the willing. That's the new, the 21st century term. And these coalitions of the willing might be big corporations, NGOs, and some cities, and perhaps a few universities. But these were all sort of actors, the new actors of change, that know how to fight each other, not how to find each other. We know very well how to put sort of multinational capital in the dock from a critical science perspective, but we know that we need to have new sort of coalitions of the willing to make this move. Now then the third was hierarchy of the 20th century. It's cooperation, probably. The of the 21st century. That is, I think, very much in the room here. Yeah? The spirit of cooperation using these gadgets to share, because one of the reasons why we needed hierarchical organization was that we needed some unit that had all the information, and now the information is, is spread out. And central rule won't work. We need sort of incentive-based rules. And I suppose that's one of the things that I, I, I think that the state can make a difference to really say we have that vision, we can still manage to keep this a pleasant place, and this is the incentive structure. We're not going to tell you what to do, but we're going to tax carbon, eh? for instance, a very logical approach. If, if you have a problem in a society of taxation in the 21st century, well, connect it to that one big problem that you have. If you have another big problem, which is labor, then reduce the amount of tax on labor. I mean, you don't have to reinvent an <coughs> sort of an employment strategy. You have to put the, the incentives right. And there again, I thought that what Bruce Katz said was I is important, but also shows you the, the, the problem of getting this play uh, on, uh, on the stage, so to say, because we 
must also allow ourselves to talk about it in a political way, where there's space for real disagreements. Because let's not forget that one solution for the, the climate crisis is not immediately supporting your sort of equality project. Huh? There are many solutions to the climate problem that say, well, we have to take that away from you. We are going to sort of control and make sure this world is going to be a safer place. So that mix of different things we want to get right is what we need. And then I suppose the urban being the site where this all happens is precisely because this is the, the space where we create new norms. I, I think that value change is going to be the driver of it all. And cities are renowned for being places where you are seen, want to be seen, and, and where people are seeing each other. And what you now see, and that is, I suppose, a really significant change, is that it becomes hip to be sustainable. Huh? A house in California that is visibly sustainable, that means it has PV on the roof, is worth more than the value of the house and the PV together. Because uh, we like to be seen to be doing good. And that is, I suppose, what also is, is coming through uh, from this conference, that there is indeed sort of a, a value change. And now the problem is, and, and, and it's, it's not Enrique's problem, because he's sort of a, an, the odd case out. You are sort of a courageous politician, but most politicians only dare to follow when they're certain that it is a majority issue. So the, the issue really for, for us now is how to construct the sort of a coalition that says, we want this. We want this, we think this is a good strategy. And I think that that will come from, from very different, different uh, uh, political issues. Um, and when Tony said the new politics of energy, I think there is no one single solution to that energy issue. And it might actually be one where you have to choose very directly whether you prioritize decentral electricity generation or central electricity generation. And a smart grid which helps people that are prosumers might be one that you want to put forward. You want to prioritize that investment to the detriment of the super grid because there's also a solution suggesting that we are going to get all our en energy and electricity from Desert Tech in Africa. And that would be a central organizational principle. So good old Charles Farrow did an investigation of uh, the Harris Harrisburg disaster in, uh, in, uh, in Three Mile Island. And what he came up with is that it was a disaster for the fact that these systems were tightly coupled. They were not loosely coupled. And I suppose one of the interesting things that we can now decide is to have very decentral energy systems that allow society to be much more democratic much more able to innovate, to readjust by changing out a module and putting in a new one and avoid that we need a strong state, which we don't have, and that we need to have central technological solutions that we probably don't want. Thank you. <laughs> That's put again the question to you. I mean, how far do you think politicians can be or the leadership that you're describing, either from politicians or from social and uh, more popular movements, how, how fast they can move in relation to Tony Giddens's um, we may be too late view? Well, I, I think uh, that if you look at it uh, historically, that politicians often do not really lead but follow. So uh, they codify something that's already happening. So if you look at the major innovations in building insulation, it wasn't that politicians said it needed to be installed, it was that the industry said they could do it. And then the rules followed. So what you can now do best is to make it an interesting trajectory. And look at the Danish uh, example. They had a sort of societal agreement that that renewable revolution was what they wanted. And that was what made it robust against coalitions that changed. The German uh, example, again, I suppose, is now well, it's, 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 it's getting controversial, but the reason why it's relatively robust is that a new interest emerged of people that now are seen, see themselves as energy producers, renewable energy producers. And they constantly monitor this acceptance rate of that energy vendor. 
Okay? So it is politicians do not walk up front, but what we could do, uh, critical social scientists, people working in industry, is show that it's actually a viable proposition. I mean, and many politicians are, I think it's fair to say, willing to be, I think, a, a bit more proactive than that in many cases, aren't they? But uh, the question is, how far can they go beyond their own image? Some do it for image purposes, some do it because they believe in it. But I think you're saying it doesn't really matter, providing they do it. That's what you're saying, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, everybody, uh, you would uh, you would like to give the politician the uh, the uh, the glory of, of being the one that uh, changed the world. But I think the, the big issue underneath will be the value issue. And often that goes uh, unintentionally. So I suppose that one of the the positive effects of the austerity of this day and age is that people look for radically different solutions. So what I find striking, for instance, in our discussion here is that the incomplete look is now idealized. Yeah? So we, we say that's good that something is incomplete. I, well, I don't know why. I mean, I like a beautiful finished building, but the reason why many buildings are incomplete is bec and, and why we start to like it, I think, is because we have to anticipate that we no longer can afford to build these expensive buildings. Yeah, so values have a funny way of adjusting to new sy uh, okay. systemic challenges. Okay, Tess has caught my eye. I'm going to ask Tony Giddens to, response to, to respond to the responses in a moment. But Tess, you've caught my eye. I yes, I just wanted to um, pick up what, what, what I think has become uh, a theme. Uh, and, uh, you know, please challenge me if I'm wrong, which is... Uh, for these sol the for these big challenges, whether it's shaping new cities or climate change, uh, to be met requires a different kind of politics, and in some senses, different kinds of politicians. The difference between those of us who are politicians is that we're on a kind of five-year contract, and um, at the end of that time, the people uh, can vote us out. Uh, a lot of you may have a bit more security of tenure than that. <laughs> um, but uh, that is an asset, it's not a liability. But I think the, the other thing is that uh, I would invite, on behalf of politics and politicians, I would invite you to be more open-minded in creating coalitions for progress with uh, uh, politicians, whether they be city level or local level or national uh, politicians, because that's the way in which good policy, uh, good policy is achieved. And um, I think that uh, somehow, you know, creating the, uh, the stocks for politics as an activity, uh, as a vocation, is entirely counterproductive in this. You know, the best cities are cities that are led, you know, by vibrant and engaged politicians who have, you know, as I, you know, would always put it, kind of grit under their fingernails, this ability um, to connect with what's actually happening in people's lives, experience the rush hour on the underground in the morning or waiting for the bus or the fury at the cars who drive up the bus lane when you're actually sitting on the bus and so forth, this sense of solidarity. And uh, I therefore uh, go back to what I said at the beginning. I think there's enormous possibility of building these kinds of alliances for long-term change and turning the product of that alliance into a kind of contract with the public more widely. But I think that this is, a, a, it's a big moment for politics and for politicians, and those who will emerge as the leaders of the next 10 or 15 years are those who understand that and are prepared to act in a different way, not always be necessarily being the politicians who are out in front mopping up the glory, uh, which is the result of other people's uh, efforts. Okay, in defense of politics, and rightly so. My fault, apologies, starting that one. <laughs> right. Tony, would you like to respond to the responses? Uh, well, I'll just respond to one or two things. Thanks very much for all the observations. Uh, first of all, I'm not interested with anyone as an optimist or not. I think the important thing is you recognize the reality of risk. And when you say you're an optimist, it should not involve the denial of risk. So, for example, you could have cancer, and you could say, I'm an optimist because I believe in lifestyle change. 
as the way of treating cancer. Well, that would be, in my opinion, a fairly foolish position to take. We, uh, I, th I think the thing, difficult thing for people, politicians and others, is to think the reality of the risk we face. We are a civilization like no other civilization. No other civilization confronted an issue like climate change. No other civilization has been global as our civilization is. Very hard to think the reality of risk and to take it seriously. So it, it's, to me, I'm not interested in the division between optimism and pessimism. I'm interested in recognizing that these risks are huge, that the scientific basis for them is extremely solid, that whatever degree of we end up with, it, it, these are massive problems, uh, existential problems at the outer range of risk for our civilization. On the other hand, as I said, this is a, you know, a high-risk high, high risk society in two senses because all risks bre breed responses and it's our obligation as global citizens to try and create responses which are equivalent to the scale of risk. What we mustn't do is just live in denial. And I fear at the moment that's what too many people are doing. They're like a smoker who says, oh, I got plenty of time to give up. Look, my granddad smoked 90 cigarettes a day and he lived to be 100 or someone will invent a cure for cancer before I get it. That, that is not a way to look at and respond to realistically a high risk, high opportunity society. We've got at least two sets of risks, climate change and nuclear weapons, which could essentially destroy large chunks of our civilization. No point pretending otherwise. Of course you can because it makes for an easy life, but as thinkers and as politicians, that is not the way to do things. It is so easy to say, oh, the risk doesn't really exist. What can I do about it? Surely it's exaggerated. The climate has always changed. All this rubbishy stuff, which, which is, there's no credence if you actually look at the, the literature. So we must recognize the reality of risk, but recognize that all risks, even the most serious, create opportunities. And for us, they could create quite radical opportunities, I think. Second, on the issue of trust, um, you know, I'm interested in trust in politicians. And, you know, social scientists have been tr studying trust for 100 years, really. The, the big issue that arises in climate change, and to some extent in our society more generally, is trust in science, actually. Uh, what, 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 what people who deny the reality of climate change are doing are denying the validity of the scientific enterprise and quite often do that openly. Scientists who work not only on climate change but other issues like animal like issues, for example, animal experimentation are on a front line in a way which was never true before the advent of the internet. Without the internet, we would never have had the case that you might know about East Anglia where the uh, climate scientists' emails were um, hacked and then became a source of massive controversy. Science is in a new position in a dialogic internet-based civilization where everyone thinks they can be an expert. And uh, really, scientists have got to th rethink their own position because they can no longer, I think, take an ivory tower view, actually. So data must be published uh, far more extensively than before. But there's a real issue because you can't really publish your data before you've worked on it. And so the real difficulties surrounding the role of scientific authority in an internet world, I think, which we should be looking at and be interested in because it's not just in climate change, it is in things like cancer. Um, you may read the place in the papers yesterday where a mother <coughs> took her child away and ran away because she didn't want him to have medical treatment. Well, is that a freedom of the individual or not? Anyway, the police went and got the child, and now the child is to have that medical treatment. I think there's a new front line here, though, in the era of the internet uh, between science and the lay person, which might be quite difficult to tread. Third, as I argue in my book, I'm in favor of what I call a politics of utopian realism in relation to climate change and other areas, too, by which I mean we have to think beyond the existing world if we're going to cope with the risks which we face. So, and uh, you know, I find more and more acceptance of this in the so-called emerging economies. Um, it's not possible for China or India simply to tread the path which the West followed. It's not possible. 
talking of traffic jams, the biggest jam in human history was from Beijing to Tibet, when it, where it went on for about four days and people were camped by the side of their road with stoves and so on because they couldn't bear to abandon their cars. And this is a country which, when I first went there and many other people, everyone rode a bike. So uh, I think we need a utopian element. We've got to revive that in politics. We've got to think beyond the world we know. And I think in the, in, the, in the realm of cities, this is very important. However, it's no good just being utopian. Climate change is very, very real, all too real, I'm afraid, and so are other risks that we face of catastrophes. Therefore, it must be bracketed to realism. There must be some way of getting there. And so I'm all in favor of, for example, like the MIT study uh, called Beyond the Automobile, which I think I proudly recommend to anyone who hasn't seen it, which envisages a kind of mobility internet with a completely different um, makeup between private and public transport that we have now, and argues that the technology is already here for this. To recognize the motor car is a lethal instrument, not just an instrument of privilege. Uh, more people have died in vehicle accidents in the 20th century than died in two world wars. The motor car is absolutely lethal. Well, we already have the technology um, in place, it's avant-garde technology, to avoid traffic accidents almost altogether. Volvo is currently devising a car which they say should never be in an accident, and we know that driverless cars are more effective than uh, ones with drivers. So I think utopian realism is where we are politically, and how to get a utopian element into everyday politics is a really, really difficult issue. But I think we start from the developing world. I mean, I'm not at all of the view that the, the poorer parts of the world have to depend on the richer for innovation. I think many innovations will come from the poorest parts of the world. And I think of what Bangladesh has done in already trying to produce resilience by, for example, creating floating gardens, by integrating um, very high technology tracking of weather systems with localized kinship groups to try and pro provide protection for poor farmers. So, sorry, I, I, I therefore stop finish. the shed, but you do take, take sorry to do that. Sorry. Right, I want to take three questions quickly. Um, <coughs> we've got three, two hands, three hands. So one, two, three, they were the first I saw, sorry. Yep, then the gentleman behind you, I'm sorry. And then that gentleman there, right. Hello, um, one? this is Vasiliki Malagasy from yes. Arab Lightning. Following a little bit what Mr. Farley said before about the developing cities and developed cities, um, we come across to the reality that the developing cities suffer the consequences of the environmental changes and the side effects of the developed cities, or otherwise the smart cities in that sense. In, in other words, effectively the least energy um, offensive cities suffer the most with very little representation in what happens to them. How do you um, suggest we address this issue? Thank you. Okay. And take that one. That's Rob Hall, sorry. I'm taking the yes, uh, I think it's interesting what Lepre on hand was. It's very interesting to discuss in Poland, to discuss the climate change, but uh, Tony has made a comment which I think are very critical. He regards the city as the center of production. And when we look back, that the main contributions to the city for the last decades all have been um, post-industrial leftism. You know, that's real and important point. And to see the possibility of a smart city, that's not just to get a smarter consumer, to get more entertainment, to get other forms of election, but really to enable the people to become makers and to create a maker's movement and to transform our neighborhoods in factories where we can integrate those who are excluded by all these new technologies which are offered as solutions by Siemens and Cisco and so on. So I mean, this is a real radical position we had to follow and to think about. And we can talk about sustainability without talking about equity. And the equity is depending from the re-inclusion of the people, and this is only possible by this mention of production. Thank you, no, no, very good. <laughs> gentleman, yeah, uh, pink tie, the gentleman with the pink tie there, and the gentleman up in the front. 
you're last, I'm afraid, fourth and last. Yes, I'm last. Sorry. Uh, uh, Savas from, uh, from the LSE. Uh, I'm just wondering if the panel could, uh, could address the issue of why the markets are shying uh, away from some of the opportunities that Tony is addressing. Uh, usually when you get a technological, technological revolution, you get a very exciting short period of financialization where barons, whether they're railway barons, car barons, barons just put the risk uh, and invest in these new opportunities. Uh, so why is keeping these markets away from exploring green tech? Because we're still kind of dealing too much about an ICT development. Okay, all right, good, good. And then jump into that. Nick, Nick Rosen from, Nick Rosen from Off Grid. And uh, I see the big battle of the next 30 years is off grid versus smart grid. America is going off grid crazy at the moment. There are TV <laughs> series all over the place and preppers coming out of your ears. And the reason that they're going off grid crazy is because of the decline in trust. It's not just trust in science, politics, but trust in all social institutions and even the society itself as a means that's going to sustain us. So people are realizing they're going to have to do it for themselves. And the smart grid seems to be a way of cementing all the mistakes of the electrical grid into place for another 50 or 100 years. Whereas what I see is, just to give you one very short big picture vision, is information is going to replace electricity. And information, Tony, is not going to need the grid. Pe I mean, I love my smartphone. People say, well, then you're not off grid, are you? And I say, well, I'm off the grid and I'm on the cloud. And the grid of computers, although it may have the same name, is not the same as the grid of electricity. You're going to have huge server farms next to nuclear power stations sending what information wirelessly to people who are running their screens and their hard drives from energy they've generated locally. And uh, the big debate now is whether that smart grid should be scrapped. All right, that's a very large question. <laughs> Thank you for that to end with. <laughs> it expanded my mind, if nobody else's. Um, right, I'm going to, I, I've now got, I'm told I've got four minutes left, or we've got four minutes left. So <laughs> what I'm going to do, I'm afraid, is to ask each of um, our respondents to respond in slightly less than a minute and then turn back to Tony Giddens for even less than that. Uh, Tessa, would you like to pick up some of the points in the questions or from earlier? Yes, yeah, um, if I can just, uh, the, the, the point about why the markets are shying away. Microphone. Sorry, um, the, you, the, the, the question about why the markets are shying away from a number of the challenges that Tony articulated, I think it's lack of consistency and certainty. Um, you know, markets will invest where there is the likelihood of stability in the, um, certainly in the medium term, and I think that there is a lack of confidence in that, which is why I think that this, uh, this challenge of building a platform of uh, stability through uh, the, uh, the sort of contract, which is based on a consensus, um, is, is so important. Um, I think that the, um, I also very much um, liked your point. I think what we haven't talked about enough is human capital as the great uh, resource here and the untapped ingenuity uh, and I inventiveness and ambition in uh, communities. It's abundant in East London, which was one of the most deprived uh, communities in our country. I've just come back from working in the slum in Mumbai, in India, in uh, Delhi, and in, uh, in Jharkhand. And I am, uh, I am in awe of the ingenuity of people living in physical conditions that are unimaginable, uh, maintaining uh, a subsistence income on the basis of their optimism and uh, ingenuity. Thanks, Tessa. Craig. I think that in addressing these issues, whether we're talking about the grid itself or we're talking about the politics of all this, we need solutions that link but don't depend on master plans. And so the design solutions that we're talking about are not the design of, of ideal comprehensive systems. They are ones that design systems that link, that are open, that, that have that potential to connect, but don't depend on whole master plans. That, put, that we need urban design that invites flexible, repurposed urban design um, that is not like urban design now, massively tilted in favor of um, 
the wealthy of enormous buildings for corporate headquarters, law centers and districts that serve the poor, the kind of things that someone like Teddy Cruz has been campaigning for in, in alternative design structures in, in um, uh, Mexico and Southern California. Th we need, though, to talk about all this in a way that scales up. And what worries me about a lot of our discourse is that it just doesn't take seriously. And Tony began to say some of this, but it's not just a question of urgency, it's a question of, of how to imagine the scaling up, um, which is quite dramatically different a challenge. So I, I very much agree with the call for people to, to be seen as makers in this, but what we're making, the poetic challenge here, um, is to be remaking a very large scale collective undertaking or else it doesn't really have um, this under the, the capacity. And we need to deal with the fact that we may well see a partial disaggregation of some of the larger structures in which we work today so that these the solutions of this future, and it's sort of hinted at already in the off-grid comment, may be one, um, not necessarily the radical disaggregation of preppers for a, a post-Holocaust future, but of, um, of reversing a long-term trend to ever larger aggregates dominating and we just need to look for ways to do that. Thank you. Enrico. Well, given that this is a, a, a conference on urban issues, cities, what I find uh, fascinating is that uh, much of what the experts in cities, so like here Richard Rogers, when he made his book about uh, the new, the, this report on the, the new British urban environment. Most of the things that urban experts propose to make a city better, uh, to have more quality of life, and uh, I refer to what Dieter said about equity, is the same policies that you will have to make a city more sustainable. Uh, so I think it's fascinating, and it's happy. It's a happy or unhappy. I mean, you can say because sometimes it's, it's easier to fight for equality than to fight for something more ethereal to some people, such as global warming. So, but what is happy is that uh, this poli when uh, all of these policies, which will be very good, such as using public transport, walking, bicycles, will make a city more equitable and also more sustainable. Uh, so you can. This is, uh, I think, uh, a good thing. We also have to be able to see how do we find this, do we solve this uh, challenge posed by Martin uh, about the flying around that people will, will hopefully will, <laughs> but, but in the other senses, I think it's a, a, a positive thing that we coincide in the objective. Okay, thank you, Martin. I think the, the, the questions su suggest again that there are different shades of green that need to be investigated. And um, look at the spaces of a city. If you walk into any airport these days, the green advertisements all over the place. There, so there is a big market proposition. There is lots of money waiting to be invested in clean tech. But whether that is the same as the off-grid solution, it's also green, but it's very different. And as Dieter uh, said about the city being a site of production, I mean, these are very different green paradigms. They are not the same. And I suppose what I, what I think is a real risk is that politics get caught up in this in a nasty sort of way. That they side with what they can understand, which is big actors that walk into their offices where you can make a deal, and that, that, they, f that they fall into the trap that the legitimacy of that green intervention is not carried by the whole population. So my single biggest thing would be to make sure that whatever you do in this green revolution, make it work for people, make it something that, that is about quality of life, something that is visible, that, that makes the quality of life of ordinary people be, uh, better. Otherwise, this might actually be a very nasty sort of transformation. Thank you. And the last word of the first goes to <laughs> Esther Giddens. <laughs> Well, I'd like to thank everyone for their comments, uh, including those in the audience. I'll just respond to the last one briefly. Um, I d what, what was said about the cloud and the smart grid, I thought was what I was saying, actually, because, um, you know, there's a collision here, a sort of interchange between new communications technologies 
and the demands of an environmentally uh, dangerous world. And that's where most of our future will be located, not in electricity as such. But if, you know, if you're on the cloud, you need electricity, you need power, because you've got to plug your bloody phone in somewhere. So you're still going to need power. Moreover, um, there will always be what sociologists call the compulsion of co-presence, because it doesn't matter how many times you'll use your mobile phone, you want to be with people, otherwise no one will be at this conference at all if we didn't need to bring people to it and be together. So the cloud is never going to replace the actual physical meeting with people in specific places in cities. All of this has to be powered. Okay, right. Thank you, Tony, and thank you, um, Tessa, Craig, Enrique, Martin. And thank you for your questions. All I'd say by way of summarizing is I think we've identified risk is the issue and the way politicians explain risk and deal. Opportunity. Risk and opportunity, sorry, risk <laughs> and opportunity and how politicians explain and challenge people with ideas, particularly I think when politicians often find it easier to sell good ideas than difficult ideas. But that's my own personal thought at the end there. Right. right. The next session will start at 3.45 and is on governing urban transformation. So drink your tea slightly faster than otherwise. Thank you very much.